I think that my work has always literally and metaphorically come from the heart. Why would an artist choose a career working in the operating room of a pediatric hospital? What joy is to be had of drawing broken hearts and the operations surgeons use to save these critically ill babies' lives? In what other ways does artist Susan Russell Hall find joy in art? Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna. I am Anna Jaworski and your host. I am also a heart mom. My son is 26 years old, but he will be 27 in just days. But I am, and it's because of Alex that I am your host. He is my inspiration. He is a heart thriver, and he is the reason I also became an author, public speaker. He has transformed my life in ways I never would have imagined possible. But what's so exciting is that it is because of Alexander that I am having a show today that is very unique. It's a show called The Art of the Heart. And I never would have met Susan Russell Hall if it wouldn't have been for my son. Susan Russell Hall is a Northwest artist and medical illustrator who comes from a long line of artisans. Her first solo exhibition was in 1977 at the Women's Cultural Center at the University of Washington. In 1979, she commenced working as a medical illustrator at Seattle Children's Hospital, moving to Mary Bridge Children's Hospital in 1998. Her work involves documenting pediatric heart surgeries from the operating room. Over the years, she has created more than 6,500 individual heart drawings. These intricate works of art are created by using charcoal, graphite, and colored pencil. As a professional artist, Susan has explored other mediums, such as acrylic and oil painting, and eventually pyrographs, the actual art of painting with fire. And we'll be getting into that more, friends. You will be amazed by this. It's really fantastic. Susan joined us earlier this year in the episode entitled, A Surprise for Heart Warrior Amy M. Lee, and I am so happy to have you back on the program, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. I cannot tell you how happy and honored I am to be here with you today. Well, we have already had fun talking before the interview. (laughs) Yes, we have. (laughs) But now we're going to get right into it so everybody else can enjoy our conversation. (laughs) When I was doing some research on you, I was so amazed at the natural born talent that you have for art. So tell me about some of your family members who are also artists and how they influenced your love of art. I first have to thank my mother, who was an artist, and also my great-grandfather, Carl Cook, who studied with and was part of the Ashcan School. But I think that I don't know if I had as much natural talent as I did just the ability to have art supplies in the house, be encouraged to do art, allow the space to do art. Art does take up room. It takes up room. And having a mom that was painting when I was little. I knew from the age of five, I wanted to be a professional artist. And for me, that meant at age five, making my life and living from art, but also giving back to people. That was really important for me to use my talents to try to make the world a better place. And so being able to have the space to paint, of that it's okay to get messy, having the crayons and watercolors around, and just allowing a child to have the ability of using different mediums and not being told you can't make a life out of art. My mom always said, you might have to work five times harder than anybody else, but Mm -hmm. if it's something that you love, don't let anybody steal your dreams. Oh, I just love that. Oh my gosh, I love that. What kind of art did your mother do? She did great big abstract work. She find found objects that she paint and put together. And as much as I begged for her to teach me art, she said, no, I want you to develop your own style. So I was one of those kids that used little tiny pencils and pen and ink and did very intricate, small, realistic drawings while she was doing huge abstract color things. 
So that was lovely too, to have someone that allowed me to be free in my own expression of art. And I love the like scientific books that we had that would have botanical illustrations and different dioramas that we used to see in museums. Yeah. But more of the very realistic technical scientific drawings were things that really appealed to me as a child. So I was very much drawn to realism where her work was completely different. That's and that was really wonderful just to be given that freedom. Right. That, so it was good. <laughs> and you said that your grandfather was also an artist. Did you live near him? Did you have his influence over your artwork as well? I have a drawing of his from 1908 that oh. looks like it was done today. Beautiful charcoal figure drawing. And I think because my great grandfather also did art, I remember as a child going down to the wharf in Portland with my mom. So it was my mother, my great grandfather, and myself all sketching down by the water. And oh. when we go on family vacations with multiple generations, Grandpa Caro would always bring his easel and be painting. And I have a picture of him in his white shirt with a tie with a little oh. makeshift easel of sticks painting outside in his trousers and belt. <laughs> oh my goodness. How my precious goodness. is that? So, wow. So art was life for you. Art was life. It was something you did on vacation. It was just life. That's mm -hmm. just what you did. Mm -hmm. It sounds to me like you, your mother, your grandfather, you all viewed life through an artist's eyes. You know what? That's absolutely true. And my grandmother took Sumi painting from Chura Obata. And I also had the joy of meeting his granddaughter at the writers' conference. And it turns out that my mother and grandmother were taking lessons from her grandfather when she was a little girl and in the house with oh them. My gosh. I mean, it's like, oh my wow. gosh, see all these connections. Yeah. Now, was she also an architect? No, her father was an architect, and she owns an incredible design company. So, yes, ah, I would say yeah, she's that an, is artist. an artist. Yeah, just a different medium. A different medium. It was just incredible in this beautiful, humble house and all of our childhood connections. Mm -hmm. And growing up with that creativity is, I think, incredibly important. I think so, too. I think so, too. And it sounds to me like your mother gave you the freedom to view the world the way you wanted to. She didn't force her vision of the world on you. She let you discover it for yourself. And from what I heard from what you were saying earlier was that the realism, the mm -hmm. actual way that plants are grown, mm -hmm. the way that we perceive the world with our eyes, is that why you decided to become a medical artist? Yeah, that's an interesting thing because I've always loved that realism. I got hired to help finish up a textbook in the orthopedics department at the University of Washington. And I was working with another medical illustrator who was married with a couple children and they were looking for someone to finish up some textbooks and do illustrations for journals in the operating room. And she's like, I have two children and you're not married and you're 22. Why don't you stay up all night and do this? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm busy. <laughs> oh my goodness. So it's almost like it was destined by God for this to happen to you. Totally. I mean, Anna, I, so I come in and here's my portfolio and oh, by the way, you're hired and now you get to stand in the operating room and draw this procedure. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm, now, had you yeah. had a physiology class and no, an anatomy like, class? I, I had anatomy for artists, which I had an idea of a skeletal structure and mm -hmm. soft tissue, but was not prepared to be in the operating room with terminology I did not understand. Right. This is not like doing still life drawing. No, not <laughs> anything like it. Now, okay. I have a squeamish stomach. And when it comes to looking at blood, I am not very good at that. <laughs> <laughs> Most Was people that, aren't. No, I would imagine most people aren't. Did you ever pass out in the operating room? I will tell you, Anna, my very first day when I was there with a sketchbook, there was a guy behind me and standing there the whole time. 
turned out to be an anesthesiologist that had a $10 bet that I would pass out before the end of the case. And he was there to collect me and the money. (laughs) Oh my gosh. (laughs) Did you send him home empty handed? Empty handed, (laughs) totally empty handed. I (laughs) completely. (laughs) Good for you, Susan. And we're still good friends to this day. Oh, that's lovely. And I'm squeamish as well, but I think the thing is you become so focused on what you're doing and everything's moving so fast and you know that what you're doing is really important and you've got to capture that. Well, I was amazed to see that you have over 6,500 hearts that you've drawn in the operating room. That's a lot of hearts. Can you walk me through the process of what it was like for you to draw while the surgeon was operating on those babies? And I'm sure they weren't all babies. I'm sure they were babies all the way on up in age, right? Absolutely. And I I work for a group of surgeons and there were seven of them. So I also did adult surgery, adult cardiac Mm -hmm. surgery, pediatric general surgery, and pediatric cardiac surgery. Primarily, all my drawings were of pediatric cardiac surgery, which is kind of birth to about 18. And I think that for me, I would often meet the parents ahead of time. And when you go in there, there is such a team working around that child, that you're just part of the team. And it was that focus, because I'd worked for a number of surgeons, of trying to get as much information down as I could, especially if two cases were going on at the same time, you're running back and forth from one room to the other. Were you really? Absolutely. Trying to document what you need to get. That's always hard when you're trying to be two places at once. Yeah. I mean, I can't even imagine that. So be specific with me because I'm trying to picture this and I'm just a mom. I don't live in the operating room, thank goodness, because I don't think I would do very well. (laughs) But when you see pictures in movies, and I'm sure it's not always accurate what you see in the movies or in TV, you see people standing around, where would an artist stand? I just had Dr. Beauvais on my show and I was talking to him about operating on these hearts the size of walnuts. And he said, well, we have very good magnifying glasses. And I'm Mm -hmm. thinking, I don't know if there's a magnifying glass big enough for me. (laughs) I'm working in a heart that tiny. The surgeons have these magnifying glasses, but what about you as an artist? I would stand on a two-tiered lift. So I'd look over the shoulder of the surgeon and I would document the drawings there unless there was valve surgery. And then I'd be more at the head of the patient by the anesthesiologist. And I would get a better view there because I'd be looking down into the heart. So if there was an aortic valve or a pulmonary valve. So I just moved from one place to another to try to get the best view. And they were obviously very accommodating, which was wonderful. So that's where I would stand. I'd read the chart to get a full history of the patient and any previous surgeries. So there'd be a diagnosis and then all the other surgeries would be documented. And then the height, the weight, bypass times, whatever was pertinent medical information to have. And then there would always be an initial drawing of the heart and then as many drawings as needed to explain the entire repair and everything would be labeled so you could see the anatomy and how everything progressed from the original defect to the completed repair. My son's surgery took eight hours. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Tell me that you were not standing along with mm-hmm. those surgeries no, for eight I would, hours. Yes, I would be there wow. for eight hours. And in fact, <laughs> my girlfriend is a pediatric surgeon said she was sure that's why I can run marathons is because I spent all that time standing in surgery. I don't know whether that's true, but it's nice to think there were some benefits of all those hours on my feet. <laughs> Home Tonight Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. 
I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home tonight forever. This content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The opinions expressed in the podcast are not those of Hearts Unite the Globe, but of the hosts and guests, and are intended to spark discussion about issues pertaining to congenital heart disease or bereavement. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. Before the break, we were learning a little bit about your artistic background and why you chose to become a medical illustrator, which I'm not so sure it was a choice now that we've had that conversation. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit more about what the work involves, aside from standing on your feet for eight hours, which I just learned, I really had no idea before we were talking that that was so strenuous for you. And to be even more complicated, that you were sometimes running in between operating rooms. How did you keep all of that information straight? Well, I worked with a heavy tracing paper called vellum. And so if I did an initial drawing of the heart, and sometimes you can see it suspended, I'd have that. And then I knew I could slip it underneath this translucent paper, and then make the changes as the repair was being done. And then I would just go back and forth keeping notes on what was going on in the various rooms so that I could go back and forth. And I have just a regular file folder that I put my drawings for one patient in then go in for the other patient so I could keep everything straight. And usually the surgeries were very different. So you absolutely knew what you were drawing. It was a lot of work. It was kind of (laughs) crazy. Yeah. I mean, after a while, you probably were even more knowledgeable than some of the medical students who were coming in because you had seen some of these surgeries performed over and over and you had drawn them. You knew exactly what the surgeons were going to do. That is absolutely true. I think you have to really understand something to be able to draw it accurately. Mm -hmm. And I had a wonderful cardiologist, Dr. Laura Tenkoff, who taught me my anatomy, physiology, and pathology. And she was incredible. If you understand something and you can draw it, then it really becomes etched in my brain. Mm -hmm. So it was very helpful because I had worked for a number of surgeons. I saw far more surgeries than usually any one surgeon would do. Because of the fact that I had seen so much surgery, I became an invaluable source. And I don't want to sound like I'm bragging at all, but I had just seen so much. And by drawing it, you could remember it. Sure. And also I'd see different techniques, especially in a time of stress. It's very nice in a very quiet voice. You can say, well, what about this or what about that? And then you can just kind of help guide people through. I know Dale really depended on my eyes and my knowledge, but I don't want to sound arrogant. And I have great respect for what everybody does. I just had seen a lot more than most people had. And like I said, in order to be able to draw something, you have to really understand it three-dimensionally, how everything comes together. You have to understand the embryology and the pathology. And so that was, I think, also incredibly helpful that I had that knowledge. And that was because I had a wonderful teacher who took time to teach me. Well, and you became like an encyclopedic resource right there in the operating room for them. You know, I think that's true. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, 6,500 hearts. Yes. (laughs) If that's not an encyclopedia, I don't know what it would be. Oh, my gosh. I just always don't want to sound like I'm arrogant. Well, you're far from arrogant. I don't think that word comes anywhere close to you. I just think it's fascinating that you really didn't plan on becoming a doctor or going into the medical field, but you Mm -hmm. had this generous heart. And you wanted to help others and you were able to use your artistic talent 
to help others better understand what it was that they were going to have happen to their children or happening to them. I'm sure when you had Mm -hmm. patients that were 16, 17 years old, it wasn't just Mm -hmm. the parents that were looking at it. It was the patients themselves. Absolutely. That's what made standing in the operating room for eight hours worthwhile. It was the fact I could go out and be with the parents to give them something solid Mm -hmm. that they could look at and say, here's what your child's heart looked like. And here's what it looks like repaired and being able to provide that understanding for people because there's nothing more stressful than turning your baby over, as you know, to somebody. There is nothing, any little bits of understanding, anything that you have that you can hold on to, especially if English is a second language and you've got all this medical terminology. Even if English is your first language. First language. (laughs) What they speak in the hospital. It it sounds like Greek. And you're being given this information at a critical time in your life. You're being told your child could die Mm -hmm. and very well may die. And you Mm -hmm. were doing these drawings since, what, the 80s, 70s, Mm -hmm. 80s, 90s? I mean, so... Unfortunately, the results from some of these surgeries were not going to be as successful as we wanted them to be. And so maybe all they had after that was -hmm. the understanding of what was supposed to happen or what did happen, whether it was successful or not. We already know from having had Amy Lee on the program that these drawings are treasured by the families and held on to for decades. It was a huge honor to be there. At that point, and that crisis, because it's really difficult. And anything you could do to help with that and help with the understanding, regardless of how things turned out, because you're right, I started in 1979 and we didn't have the technology or the drugs or um, the equipment that we do now. With a lot of the congenital heart defects, there was a very high morbidity and mortality rate. Just being able to offer someone understanding that understanding that this isn't sustainable with life, but everybody did everything they could. Right. Just, yes. just, my hope was just that there was some way that that would help with the grieving process of just offering that understanding. Yeah. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. Mm-hmm. Knowledge is power. Absolutely. When I was doing research on you, madam, I found out that there was somebody who actually took your drawing and had a tattoo made out of it. It's so true. Isn't that amazing? How did that make you feel? It was incredible. I love it. And I'm still in contact with that patient. Are you really? And their child. And so it was really wonderful. I love it. I love it. And that some children actually use your drawings as their science project. Oh my gosh. And let me tell you, everyone that did got the blue ribbon. (laughs) Oh my goodness. (laughs) (laughs) I love that though, because what you've done is you've given them a tool to understand a hidden defect. Mm -hmm. And that empowers them. I just love that. I love the fact that you're empowering the parents, you're empowering Mm -hmm. the patients, and for that matter, the surgeons and other people in the operating room with your encyclopedic knowledge. You were a great resource to so many people. Well, thank you, Anna. It was an honor and privilege to be there and to help any way I could. Absolutely. So there had to have been some cases that were maybe a little bit more memorable than others or more challenging as an artist. Can you tell me about maybe some of the more challenging cases you had? Well, the case that went on for 18 hours, where I was in the operating room standing for 18 hours, that did not count the time it took to get dressed, to go to work, to wait for the case to start, (laughs) to get home. That was incredibly challenging. And I remember the surgeon saying, you know, the best thing about this case, you can't tell whether it's two in the morning or two in the afternoon. And the rest of us were like, we know it's two o'clock in the morning. (laughs) (laughs) And yes, we're really tired. and We'd love to go home. In fact, we're kind of hungry and we'd like something to drink. Okay. So when there's a case that goes on that long, 
Are there any artists that are willing to give you a break while you're doing a case like that? I mean, certainly after so many hours, you get a chance to go rest your feet or get something to drink or eat. I mean, isn't that true? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, it depends on the intensity of the case. That was a redo. So there was times I could sit down and I could go out for five minutes and use a restroom or get some water, get something to eat. But I would always plan it as such so that I knew I wasn't missing anything, which was good. But there are times where it just is really critical. And in those moments, you just go to a completely different zone and you're just working and the hours disappear and suddenly you realize, whoa, that's been a long time yeah. because I think you're so wrapped up in what you're doing right. and how critical it is. So, how do you no. know what part to draw though? I mean, like you were just saying, there are critical parts. There's lots of things that are going on. Tools are being passed here and there and changes are being made. How do you know what it is that needs to be drawn? Well, thankfully, with the help of Dr. Tenkoff, I learned all the different steps of the procedure so I could get a good feel for, okay, this is a drawing where the defect is, say there's a hole in the heart, and then I'll do work to expose that unless it's something that you can open up the heart and then it's right there. And what sort of material do you use to close it or how do you close it? You know, I'm just showing those stages of closing the heart, of closing the defect and then closing the heart. So you just learn over doing the different procedures, what the critical stages are, and then also what the abnormalities are when you start looking at the heart, because you just know the cardiac anatomy from all the work and the studying and the drawing that you've done. So So could you right now take a piece of paper and a pencil and draw a tetralogy of Fallot? Yes. Yes, (laughs) ma'am. That's amazing. (laughs) That that would be helpful for anybody, but that is etched in my memory. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I imagine it is. Was there ever a heart that was being operated on that people just looked at it and said, oh my goodness, what do we call this? That it's not nice and neat where you know that this defect and that defect equals Tetralogy of Fallot. Because as we know, Tetralogy of Fallot has four major defects that Mm -hmm. would be drawn. But I'm sure that there were some children who it didn't look like there was a clear-cut definitive diagnosis. Absolutely. That's the thing as heart surgery on adults, most adults are born with normal hearts. And then over time, maybe they need to have a graft because some of their arteries are clogged or occluded. They may need to have valves because either they've had a disease or infection process that's affected the valves or they've just worn out. But they're basically normal heart structure, where with children, you can have an array of abnormalities that may not just relate to the cardiac function, but to lungs and skeletal functions as well. So there will be a multitude of things that can happen. And you can put those diagnoses in a category or describe it by the various defects that are there. But You're absolutely correct. That's one of the things with being there in the operating room and being a medical artist is you can document those cases where there's a number of different things wrong with ventricles and valves and arteries and unusual connections or lack thereof. Right. Like, especially to the lungs, Mm -hmm. I've heard that that's a real major situation that sometimes they're not anticipating that, oh my goodness, Mm -hmm. like the coronary arteries are connected properly or something like that that you wouldn't really think about with a baby. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. You can have a single coronary artery. You can have a plethora of abnormal coronary artery problems. We tend to, as adults, think of coronary arteries that over time, maybe there's too much plaque that's built up and then they become occluded versus with the children, they're just born that way. Mm -hmm. Were you ever in the operating room and you were working on your sketch of the heart, but it became apparent that there was something wrong with the lungs. And did you ever draw any of the other organs as well to show relationships or different sizes or problems that might be occurring? Absolutely. And oh, really? with And also doing general surgery as well as cardiac surgery, there's a lot of times where, you know, the body's an amazing puzzle. And so if one piece isn't quite right, it can affect a number of others. So yes, things with the lungs and trachea and diaphragm. So 
You're absolutely right. And I would do diagrams sometimes with embryology so you could understand how that heart was formed that way, as well as just functionality. And it sometimes was helpful to have the before and the after so parents could understand how the blood gets oxygenated and functions in a more normal way. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect or CHD community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Heart to Heart with Anna is a presentation of Hearts Unite the Globe and is part of the Hug Podcast Network. Hearts Unite the Globe is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to uplift, empower, and enrich the lives of our community members. If you would like access to free resources pertaining to the CHD community, please visit our website at www.congenitalheartdefects.com for information about CHD, the hospitals that treat children with CHD, summer camps for CHD survivors, and much, much more. Before the break, we learned about your work as a medical illustrator, and it is a much more fascinating job than I ever could have imagined, Susan. How did this work inform your practice as a professional artist? Because I know you do things outside of the operating room. Yes, now I have the privilege of working in my studio. I was going to laugh without a mask, but now that COVID happened. (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) Right. (laughs) But thankfully, I've been maskless in my studio since I've been the only one there, There (laughs) other than my art partner. So this is good. And I think that love of realism, the love of the layering, when you look at the work that we're doing now, there can be up to nine layers of material. And I always like to have that light that it feels like it's emanating from behind And I think that my work has always literally and metaphorically come from the heart. I love that. I saw in an article about you that the two worlds of art that you live in were both highly influenced by the heart. And I just felt that was so lovely. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. So those of you who would like to go and learn a little bit more about Susan will have an opportunity to do so. Tell me about some of this other artwork. You said that there's lots of layers, but when I saw the pictures of the other artwork that you did, it seemed more abstract. And it makes me wonder if maybe now you're moving more towards your mother's realm. I think I have a foot in both the abstract and the realism. And even though now the work that I'm doing with my partner, Terry Rochelle, tends to be more realistic, there always is an edge of abstraction. Mm -hmm. So it is quite lovely that everything's kind of coming full circle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I love the flowers that I saw that you did. Oh, so, so gorgeous. Now, Mm -hmm. when you were a little girl and you were out with your mother and your grandfather with his easel and his tie Mm -hmm. and everything, (laughs) I just (laughs) love the picture that that paints in my mind. Were you drawing flowers then? Were you drawing things that you saw in nature then? I was always connected with nature. I have these little tiny intricate drawings of flowers and mushrooms and anything I could find. Pine cones. I've been always influenced by nature. And that's where I go probably for my personal renewal. Probably the reason that I love long distance running. And it's also been my inspiration for my paintings, even the abstract ones, that the light, the shadow, trying to paint in the feeling of the temperature and the wind. Nature's always where I went to kind of decompress when things get tough. So it's been my healing place. So you would spend six, eight, 18 hours in the operating room working on these medical... Thankfully, only once 18 hours. <laughs> Thankfully, yes. Thankfully. I can't even imagine once doing that. But 
that had to have been a very stressful environment. Would mm-hmm. you on your time off sometimes do some of this other artwork that we're talking about as a way to decompress? I would. It would be other artwork. And it's interesting when I would leave the hospital in the operating room, I would just let my eyes rest in the landscape around it. You know, Mm -hmm. even if it's the road, the trees, the plants, so that I could make that almost like a visual break from where I've been. Yeah. To just help me in that drive home to just kind of unwind and decompress. I love that. I know people are going to be curious about your artwork, and I know it's available in two different galleries as well as online. So can you tell us where we can see more of your art? You can see more of my art. Uh, My website, it's SusanRussellHall.com, and then also Russell Rochelle, and then the Friesen Gallery in Sun Valley. I just love all the stuff that I saw that you did online, especially you in the studio. It gave me a much better... (laughs) sense of what it is that you do. So before we end, you have to tell us about this pyrographic art. I've (laughs) never heard of that until I started reading about you. How in the world did you get involved in this? Well, I started with encaustic 17 years ago. Encaustic just means burned in. I use wax and resin and paint. I melt it in a skillet and then I use a blowtorch to melt it down. And then I started doing work with a blowtorch on paper, finding that edge between beauty and destruction. So I have a series of pyrographs, which are actually done by flames on a piece of paper, slowly worked over the paper to get this beautiful sepia brown feel. And I would not have attempted that had I not spent years working with a torch and wax. (laughs) So, um, okay. So it's kind of fascinating. Yes. See, to me, that's where I feel like you've gone more into the abstract. And I can Mm -hmm. see where your mother's influence might have been part of your art without you really even realizing it. I believe you're absolutely correct, Anna. Absolutely. It feels in a way that it's all coming full circle. Yeah. Well, tell us about what the future holds for you. Do you have something special lined up for us with your art? Yes, there will be a book that will be out soon, which is very exciting that's being done now. We had a very, very successful show in Sun Valley. In fact, I think there's only at this point one painting left. So that was really exciting. That is exciting. Oh, wow. Congratulations. And there are some exciting things ahead in 2023 that I'm not at liberty to talk about now, but it will be very big. And when that happens and when we get things firmed up, it will be a joy to share that with you. Oh, great. So, And that too really has a circle about collaboration and healing and bringing people together. So this is a theme in your life, Susan. You know what? I think it is, Anna. It is really amazing looking back. It truly is that it's a huge you know, kind blessing. of feels, huge blessing, a huge blessing. Yes. When you feel like your life has had meaning and purpose, mm-hmm. it makes mm-hmm. you appreciate and have so much gratitude for what it is you've been able to do. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. You're just like, wow, okay, this was my purpose. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to keep at it for as long as I need to. Right, right. (laughs) I am so glad that Amy Emily brought us together. (laughs) It has been so much fun learning about what a medical artist does and how you do your work and how you've been able to help generations of members of the Congenital Heart Defect community. So thank you for the service that you have provided for all of these decades, Susan. Well, thank you, Anna. And you're very welcome. I'm learning to say thank you. (laughs) And I guess the biggest thing for me is I want to thank you for what you're doing, because none of this would have happened with Amy or myself if you hadn't been a wonderful heart mom and realized what your purpose was and working so hard to connect everybody in the global cardiac community. So I just have to reflect back. We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be connected without you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work. 
Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate you saying that. I do feel that Alexander's heart defect, oddly enough, has given me a new purpose in life that I never would have guessed because I'm such an introvert that I never would have thought I would be giving speeches or doing (laughs) podcasts. He totally brought me out of my shell, but it has been such a delight to help make some of the connections that I've made. And it does feel like this is my purpose in life. Mm -hmm. It's been incredible. And look at all the connections you've made nationally and globally. Talk about getting pushed out of our comfort zone. It's almost like that's where the miracles fly is on the other side of the comfort zone. Oh, that's so beautifully said. That is so, so true. Well, I'm so happy that you're going to give me an excuse to have you back on the show. Yay! (laughs) (laughs) Just keep coming up with all these creative new projects and we'll have you back on the show so we can talk about them. This has been totally delightful. Friends, I'll make sure that I put the links that Susan mentioned in the show notes. So those of you who are driving or jogging or on your elliptical, you don't have to worry about grabbing pen and paper. All you have to do is check the show notes and that's the description of the show. So thank you, Susan. I'm looking forward to having you come back on the program. But that does conclude this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. If you enjoyed this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna, please take a moment and drop me a line on Facebook or on my website and let me know what you liked about the episode. And remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you have been inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community. Heart to Heart with Anna, with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Time.